all have a story. In fact, we are a story. Our stories shape and influence every dimension of daily life and relationships. I'm Rachel Clinton Chen, co-host of the Allender Center podcast. Here at the Allender Center, we believe that knowing the impact of our stories and finding God's redemptive work within them can transform not only our own lives, but the ways we engage the world around us. One of our greatest joys at the Allender Center is to be able to lead and support people just like you through engaging your own story at our story workshops. When you participate in a story workshop, you'll experience teaching from Allender Center instructors and guidance of small group facilitators who will help you explore your own story and the themes of your life in a supportive environment. If you are looking to understand your story more deeply and to learn more about how it intersects with the story of the gospel, then the story workshop is for you. No matter the harm you've endured, there is hope for restoration. There is hope for a renewed vitality of your own life. It's not easy work, but it has never been more important to gain such a crucial understanding of your own story. If you are ready to step boldly into your unique and deeply beautiful story, then reserve your spot today to participate in one of our upcoming story workshops at the allendercenter.org slash events. Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Rachel, sometimes I think it's wise to offer those gracious beings who listen to us uh, a context as to why we might be doing a particular podcast. This happens to be one of those. So let me give you the beginning. Uh, It was a lovely, lovely, warm mm, summer day. And Becky said, why don't you just take a half hour uh, just out in the sun, you know, on in a chair or a recliner or whatever, and just sit or lie down. I'll get you a blanket. And I'm like, what? What? What do you mean? She said, just go rest. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do have to finish a section of a book. And she said, don't take anything. Just <laughs> go listen to the birds, to the buzzing, to the crackling idol of the summer sun. And I'm like, hell no, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) That is something akin to torture. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about rest. (laughs) So you better lead here because I, I, I'm I'm already I'm already pissed. Like I just oh. don't want to do this. Mm. Yeah, and I I think to talk about rest in some ways we'll have to talk about why why is rest so hard? Uh, you know, because when you're describing what you're being invited to, that's like oh yeah, I love that. I could spend hours doing that. I mean, I used could to you? go to I used to go to Golden Gardens uh, near Ballard and just sit on a beach town, watch people play and listen to the sound of the water lapping against the shore. Mm. I mean, hours. I mean, I I used to lay in my hammock and listen to bugs and the trees and the wind. So yeah, I rest. I mean, I, I was a single woman for it till I was 37. So yeah, I had a lot of free time on my hands too. <laughs> like if, if you didn't cultivate a capacity to do nothing, um, I don't know. That's just. Well, it, it, let me remind you that uh, without you, I would never have been able to finish or write uh, a book on Sabbath. So Becky's last remark to me, kind of like, <laughs> I, like when oh, no. she saw my level <laughs> of disquiet at the thought of resting, 
she was like, you know, you did write a book on Sabbath. And I'm like, you, <laughs> that's low. That is a low blow. I mean, I, I, I think that the framework I was able to bring was, I know I'm a inveterate Sabbath breaker and that rest is not a natural experience. And even in this conversation, she asked me the question, like, when, when did you have your first job? And I, you know, my answer was quick, like, oh, nine is when I started working for my dad in the bakery. And again, it wasn't every day, it wasn't every night, et cetera. But it's, I don't think, and this, this is the arrogance, like, oh, when I rest, I think I'm too, I can really rest. And she's like, oh, you have to have an activity to rest. In other words, <laughs> You have to have a distraction to avoid the potential to come back to work. And I don't think it's as simple as I'm a workaholic, even if I no. am. Yeah. I don't think it's just that I find my identity and uh, my sense of connection and support, even though it's there with regard yeah. to. So as we begin to talk, you are more gifted at rest, let's just say. So when you think about summer, as we're in the middle of, how for you do you approach something of the idol, the season? When I want to say idol, I don't mean I-D-O-L, the rest of summer, the, the beauty, the sun, the, mm. yeah, it's, it's a season of intersection of rest and play. It doesn't mm. have the same frenetic reality of the fall. It doesn't have that down sense of winter or that intensity of in 12 weeks, 70% uh, mm. of the earth grows of spring. So there is a different hue, mm -hmm. color, tone, really feel. So as you approach your own summer, even though we're in it, how do you how do you think about this given summer and the nature of rest? Yeah, that's such a great question. And honestly, it's like, well, in what season? <laughs> like in what season of life? Like not like what, you know, season of like the earth, but like what season of life? Because certainly other seasons have looked different um, on how I think about rest and and the spaciousness of of summer, you know, I mean, and, and where I lived, right. Because the Pacific Northwest, you know, it's summer is glorious and the days of summer are so like the contrast between winter and summer, like the sun comes Huge. up at like four 30 in the morning and goes really goes down around like 10, 10 30. And so there's even a felt sense of like time. It feels like time expands. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, I'm a little bit more South in Philadelphia. So we, but even still like the, this morning when we woke up at six with Evie, the sun was up and it will stay up until about eight 30, like, you know, nine. And so there's something about even the light, like the way the light lingers that invites a different kind of, of posture, but with like teenagers, and a an emerging toddler um and like swim team and baseball um summer feels different these days <laughs> like yeah, at work yeah, it's, you're... you know it's... <laughs> and and to further complicate even this like within maybe hours we have a family from California about to move in for mm. the summer mm -hmm. which we are out of out of the moon with excitement and already can't wait till they leave so the intersection of is a busy summer and summer tends to be um vacation cookout staying right. up later outdoors uh family visiting vacations etc cetera, etc cetera. It, it's not really a season of rest uh as we normally think of it particularly as you name the Pacific Northwest, which <laughs> is already uh, fundamentally, uh, I would say character-wise, a very 
passive aggressive world, but it, it gains even more so a kind of mania. Oh yeah, so manic of... because you're like, here's the two months of sunshine, <laughs> and you feel like you have to make the most of it. Like I literally remember when, when the first fall rain would come, I would feel like, oh, finally I can just go inside and do nothing <laughs> and not feel like guilty. <laughs> so as we come back to this, and I, I hope the connection for most people, will be, is this a season of rest? Right. And how do we make it? And what is the uh, peril? Uh, if if those of you can rest, you know, just shut down, uh, you know, go to another podcast. But the bottom line is, for those of us who know that rest is not easy, because it's a season like yours with lots of complexity in your family, or same with regard to our family, yet there's already a barrier, an obstacle to the very nature of what rest holds. How would you approach this as you're talking to a friend, perhaps like me, uh, over mm. a podcast? Mm. You know, <laughs> um, I would, because of the work we did on Sabbath, I probably would get into um Sabbath categories. And, you know, I've had the privilege of talking with you about like something like a sabbatical or, you know, a, an intentional season of rest and play. And I think that's the word I would come back to is like, it's actually a spiritual practice. Um, mm -hmm. There is a, there is a, a deep intentionality, like rest doesn't just come, rest is not just um, dissociation or like taking a nap. It's, and I remember that's something we had to really wrestle with so much in our Sabbath research. Like rest is a, a slower, deeper kind of presence. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's that capacity to really take in goodness and delight and anticipate it. Um, and so it does require intentionality around what you're going to stop doing or what kind of boundaries you're going to set to like set apart that space and time. Um, I think it's really hard because for so many of us, we keep ourselves busy because our heartache, our, the conflicts in our relationships, the exhaustion we actually feel if we stop. I mean, how many people when they stop to like go on a vacation get sick because when their body actually comes down. So, you know, this is hard and we're coming out of a season of the whole world changing with what happened with the pandemic and um, the uprising of atrocious racial violence and injustice. And so there's a lot of grief and a lot of heartache mm -hmm. and a lot of change, a lot of trauma that also we are carrying in our bodies. And so my sense would be for a lot of people, myself included, listening like an invitation. I mean, I'm I'm a post, I have a almost one year old. I mean, it's like to stop and rest is to let some of that madness also enter. You can't be present to the beauty of creation and slow down without also making space for some of the madness to be present. Yes. And one term that I find really helpful, maybe not so much to get me into a place of rest, but is the reality of allostasis, which is the notion that we ramp up over long periods of time and it becomes the quote unquote new normal. And the intensity of engaging this, doing this, going here, having this crisis, having to deal with this. For most of us, we have been in years of a global crisis and, as you put it, exceedingly well, racial, gender, the issues of conflict, of division, of questions, of deep and uncertainty. And every dimension of ambiguity and uncertainty creates a rise of anxiety. Another word for anxiety is stress. Another word for stress stressed by a chemical. So we've been living high, uh, not on the hog, but high on stress by a chemical. So most of us are in not homeostasis, but allostasis. And that mm. is that ramped up. So when you begin, as you put it brilliantly, like the number of times 
on vacation, the first several days, either two things happen. I get sick and I get mean. And my children <laughs> were able uh, pretty early on to begin saying things like, Dad, are you going to ruin the first few days of vacation? Mm. And if so, can you just go and be alone? Um, and then when you get a little bit better, come back. It was so heartbreaking to have them so capably predict that my body ramped up on allostasis. When you come down, it isn't that you return to homeostasis. You literally lose the high of stress, but also the other biochemicals that, shall we say, give you a good mood uh, actually drop as well. So a lot, mm -hmm. it's sort of a situational depression that often occurs when mm -hmm. we begin to let down. And I, I think when you're aware that when you lose stress biochemicals, even though most of us say, I don't want them, yet when you do, serotonin, which m moderates uh, our moods, drops. So we are literally closer, at least mm -hmm. into the realm of depression. And that feels like Oh my gosh, I don't I, I can't afford to let down given even if you're asking me for a half hour or an hour, if I begin to let down, I know what's going to happen. I'm gonna need time to metabolize a different way of being. And that feels mm -hmm. scary uh, mm -hmm. and unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I mean again, um, I know we're going to, I, I, I'm assuming, and we're going to talk, we're going to get into some of the biblical passages that invite us to rest on, you know, most specific, like the one that we all would think about is Matthew 11. Um, but there is a, cause I do think there is a sense of, um, to move into a season of rest that we're going to intention as rest. And, and again, realistically, so for all of us who have teenagers who are out of school or kids who are out of school it's a hard summers can be hard because you you've oh. got to find ways to keep you got to keep working and you got to find ways to keep your children occupied and not just on screens all the time however even in that you can set apart like what kind of mania are you willing to not be in in the summer months when certain things cease or you even if you have a four-week window where there's not sports or activities um but it's like we actually have to let go of some things we have to unburden Right. Because uh, mm. even what we're putting words to is like we actually have to be honest about what are some of the things we're carrying with us. Um, and and sometimes I think that actually takes like rituals, too, of like anytime I'm heading into like a season that has a little bit more space, I typically have to like I have to have some projects that I do that are like <laughs> they are my like physical manifestation of like letting go of some things, you know, like I have to mm -hmm. clean, I have to like deep clean and like maybe like clear out some closet space. And then all of a sudden I feel like, okay, there's a little more, you know, it's, uh, do you have any practices like that? Or does that just lead to, okay, now I'm going to just do all the projects instead of resting. <laughs> I think Becky would like swoon if a project were like, creating order, uh, cleaning <laughs> out a closet. But no, that's I, I would not put myself in that. I, I, I admire that for you and others. Spring cleaning in preparation for the summer makes, makes perfect sense. But that element of, and I just want to keep going back to your words, like what do you carry? And mm -hmm. we've carried certain things and normalized it. Mm -hmm. Even to a point, likely, that if you go just a little bit deeper, you know you're caring more than you quote unquote should. Mm. But not only does it feel necessary, uh, requisite, but also if you're, uh, at least I'll admit it, that there's a certain pride. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got so many meetings today. I've got so many things mm -hmm. to get done today. And the idea of a empty schedule, which sounds fabulous as I look at it uh, and I go, ooh, it's not 
simple or easy. So what we carry probably has this at least intersection of fear and pride, power, because of what we're able to carry that likely other people can't quite carry. Yet mm-hmm. on the other hand, that that uh, element of if I let go, what will happen? So when you think about what you carry that you know is more, how does that passage in Matthew 11? And let me just let me just yeah. uh, bring it into conversation. Mm-hmm. To me, it's really important to go uh, context. Uh, you know, you you have at the beginning of chapter eleven, Jesus acknowledging uh, the relationship between him and John the Baptist, and mm-hmm. using that as a framework for exposing the Pharisees as you, you you don't want to critique him because the people love him. On the other hand, you don't want to use what he's saying and repent uh, because it would disrupt uh, your religious power. So he's using his relationship with John the Baptist to expose, but then he's coming, at least in the book of Matthew, to one of the most clear statements of her, uh, of his relationship with the father. And again, you can look at like John 13 through 17, and you've got a thousand statements of his unique relationship with the father. But this is in Matthew, one of the, one of the first. And uh, he says, at, at this time, Jesus said, I praise you, father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and revealed them to little children. Again, important to know, children were not valued. Mm -hmm. Uh, Children were less than uh, any sense of care. They were a burden. That's why the disciples wanted to make sure Mm -hmm. they had no contact with the rabbi. So the fact he's essentially saying, This is for you who are little children. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then the sweet invitation, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, That has been a verse that, as you can imagine, uh, I've spent a lot of time in and a lot of conflict with. But I'm wondering what you have done with this, especially (laughs) in the light of this conversation. Yeah. Uh Yeah. I mean, I think I could also, I could say myself, this is a passage that, you know, something in me goes, oh, yeah, right. Like, (laughs) how are we supposed to just, you know, oh, let me just, you know, because so many of, I think, the overwhelming things that feel heavy are like work related, you know, or like trying to provide sustenance for your family and living in a (laughs) extreme capitalist society that, you know, in many ways we're there it's the tyranny of constant labor just to like survive to some extent. And so, and I feel like I'm, I'm more privileged than a lot of people I know in that. So there's something in me that's like, sure, Jesus, sure. You know, like, let me just set down my heavy birds. (laughs) But there is also something in me that knows what it is to relinquish to God in many ways, the burdens that we will carry for our life that are too much, um, that do steal joy, um, that, that seduce us into believing if we just try harder, work harder, you know, they'll become lighter eventually. Um, yes. And I think so mostly where I went when you were reading was I was thinking about some of the conversations we've had this, this winter and spring around like, grief and bitterness and some of these more what I would call like emotional burdens, but things that can really take up a lot of space and feel quite heavy. Um, And, you know, Evie's going to turn one this summer. 
um, which feels like such a huge threshold. And, um, and I'm remembering being like super pregnant, like I was last summer. <laughs> all summer long, it was so hot. Um, and so I do have like this deep desire. And I think we just have this awareness of like, our boys are just growing so fast. Like it's just going so fast. And what would it mean to entrust Jesus in a way that's not denying or minimizing like the heavy things we carry, but at <laughs> least acknowledging that I don't carry them alone. And I'm not like that. It's also, it is okay. Like it is the work will continue without me if I take a step back for a moment. Um, and that it is okay to take in joy. Um, you know, I just think as a hypervigilant traumatized person, like, you know, we didn't even, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but like, we didn't even talk about gun violence in the list of things we talked about, which just feels yeah. so like, you know, for me, that's a huge burden I'm carrying into this summer that I feel like nowhere is safe, nowhere is sacred. Like, how can you rest when you never know when you're potentially going to be in harm's way? Um, and so again, that it's these realities that they don't just magically go away because we decide to stop carrying them. <laughs> right. Well, and I think for me, it, what you're naming is, look, this passage has been a comfort at seasons, yeah. but more like a provocation where I feel so exposed in between both my fear and pride. Like I can carry a whole lot. And mm -hmm. if you can, oh, that's, well, see if you can carry this extra pound. But if you can't, I'll do it. And they're like, go, oh, God, I just even saying it. I'm like, oh, Jesus, what God, um, prideful flatulence is involved in that. So to step back and to be able to go, can I use it as a means of assessment? Which may sound very mechanical, but... What am I carrying that right now feels really hard, really burdensome, really heavy? And is that an assessment tool to be able to say, well, okay, there is something here that is foul because the heaviness alone is enough of an indication that this is not what Jesus has for you. So what Again, you can't change the dynamic of having two brilliant, beautiful adolescent boys out of school and a toddler who <laughs> I, I, I think, from my standpoint, having been a little bit around her, like you need to be watching her 100% One, of the time. 24-7. There is not a break. <laughs> You should be awake twenty four seven because that child, you know, if you want to, if you want to keep that child alive, you better be hyper focused. So you can't change that. You can't just go. I'm going to the hammock, folks, for yeah. the next three hours. But then the question becomes: Given the weight of that, are there other weights related to it that actually? intensify that load in a way that needs to be exposed and needs to be addressed. And, you know, for Becky in this beginning conversation, she was like, let's talk about your fear of boredom. Mm. I'm like, oh, come, come on, woman, you know too much. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, and she's saying, if you were on the hammock for a half hour, you would be figuring out a podcast. You'd be planning the next portion of the book you're working on. And I'm like, yeah, and that's a problem. And she's like, yes, yes, it is, because it's not rest. Uh, it's your play, and thank God that you enjoy that play. Yeah. But would you actually let yourself be, and a, a word that we use in our culture now, mindful, tuned into the sound of um, the world around you and be captured by it and let mm. your heart be taken in by indeed your backyard beauty. Mm. Um, and she said, I don't think you can do that because you need to be hyper-focused 
And even if you were hyper-focused on the world around you, it's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, will you let something down? And again, I, I, I'm not at a point where I can clearly know what I'm at war with, other than I committed that over the next three days, which I did say 72 hours, I will take a shot at that 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. But when you when you think of letting down, letting go, even though you can't let go, your son's summer or your daughter's exploration, what needs to be let go for you to have a better taste of Matthew 11? Well, first, I just want to say I'm going to look forward to hearing how that 72, 72 hours, that 30 minutes sometime in 72 hours goes for you. So we'll have to have a follow up conversation. Well, do you want a picture to prove it? Becky, just say if you get close to the 30 minutes, I will come and take a photo. <laughs> yeah, I do. I want to see the picture. <laughs> uh, I, that's such a good question. Um, and I think... You know, part of the way that I have been, I think, living into that question, I don't actually have an answer, is I have been, I I did spend the spring preparing for summer and the play of summer. I brought Mm. bubbles for Evie, Um, lots of bubbles, like things that um, imagining, like we've been taking walks, evening walks in the garden in our concrete jungle. Uh, We live in South Philadelphia um, and there's empty lots across the street from our row house that during the beginning of the pandemic, people got permission from the city to turn into gardens, like community gardens. And so, you know, we've been going on evening walks in the garden. When we go to baseball games, we take a blanket and toys and, um, you know, just trying to take in this season. And, and so like, even like as stupid as this will sound, like I've imagined like buying sunscreen as a way of preparing for the rest and play of summer, because, Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to be outside and we've been inside for so long and, you know, cause it's cold and Philly in the winter and, um, and it actually was a cold spring. So we, you know, it's like, you know, it's hot, it's hot now, but just getting to have these kind of rituals of like, you know, we're going to be at the baseball field and there's something about the sounds and smells and, and cheering and, and just getting and like actually having the freedom and the privilege to like be at a baseball game and our kids running around and doing something they love. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's been really little ways that I've had to let go of. There's a ton of house projects that we need to be working on. And there's, you know, there's for me, there's always a thousand lists of things that like need to be done and need to be addressed. And yet there's something in me very defiant um, that is like, we get to, we're going to enjoy this season of connecting together. We're going to eat slow meals. Um, we're going to let the evenings linger, even though you're supposed to put your baby to bed at the same time every night. Like, we're not going to do that. I'm letting the sleep schedule go. That is something I am letting go and unburdening myself with the like, you know, 10, 11, 12 month sleep schedule because yeah, she will sleep and we're going to take advantage of being outside uh, and the cool of the evenings. Mm. I don't know if that answers well, your question. That's what came it to does. It, 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 well, and I, I think even as you're putting words to it, I, I'm going back to part of the conversation with my beloved. And one of the things she said is, um, if, if you lie down on the hammock or just sit in a chair, you, you're going to begin to have a sense of your grief. And mm-hmm. not just your mm-hmm. grief, but the grief mm-hmm. that you hold with regard to others. And your busyness is, in some ways, a form of boundary. Like, I can't think about my grief or the grief of others because I've got to do the podcast and then Mm -hmm. I've got to meet here. So the boundary, you know, busy is a boundary. Busy is idolatry. Busy is uh, an escape. And, And she named that 
dear friend has uh, a beloved puppy, a, a beloved dog that has just been diagnosed with cancer. Um, a dear, dear friend, uh, and this is all today, um, and a dear friend lo lost his job, which uh, in the context is incredibly stupid of the employer because of the incredible value he he brings to this organization. Mm -hmm. But a political morass that created a drama, and uh, he was handling it with incredible integrity. And because of that, he got fired. So I know that if I go, those two realities that have come out literally an hour before we began this podcast, I feel it. I feel it, and I, I want to call. I want to pray. I, I'm angry. I'm confused with our living God, and it's just that's a speck, not of what I carry, but what I know God carries. Mm -hmm. So the realm of being able to go, let go. Uh, this sounds dangerous let go human suffering for a half hour. Let, mm -hmm. let go even your questions uh, about what it means to trust God. Let go. Let, will you just take in warmth, beauty, kindness for a brief moment? Um, I'm get, I think I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting closer to what mm -hmm. I'm at war with. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think what you're naming is just is why so rest is so deeply desired and yet so utterly terrifying, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, because I think and 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 it is a, like what you're like the 30 minute boundary line feels so kind because it still feels really long if it's something you're not you're not it doesn't feel like a normative practice. Um, and I think that that's, that's what I would say is like, do we also have permission to like grow faithfulness in the small? Um, because to, to enter rest and, and really be present to beauty and to delight and to taking in goodness is really risky. Mm -hmm. Um, and like you said, and, and it opens our hearts to be present to things that actually like, you know, we've talked about how like making space for grief paradoxically does bring rest. It does invite a different kind of rest to the heart than our avoidance of grief and trying to keep grief at bay. Um, that's not like always, you know, it's, it's not like a always the case. Sometimes grief can feel really debilitating, but there's something about the honor of grieving what is meant to be grieved and being present with people who can grieve with us. But I'm just thinking about like, what do you do if you're in a marriage that, you know, part of what you long for is someone who will join you in the rest. And so you set your heart up to practice that, but they can't join you, you know? And so it's like, I don't think anything we get to do in this realm is um, without like profound tension, which is why I yes. think practicing in the small grows our capacity to bear that tension and still take yes. in what it is we're meant to take in. Well, and it's interesting. I haven't thought of it until you put words to it. But the small itself uh, is the easy uh, yeah. compared to the large. Um, and so if I'm trying to be faithful to the large and I'm not willing to take the half hour, then already there's a certain rebellion. And as you put it, you had a defiance to create that. I, I'm more of the stance of I have the defiance. I won't go there. Um, <laughs> and yet to be able to go, oh, let it go. Mm. You literally can come back to the grief you feel on behalf of your friends. But not now. Not mm -hmm. for the next 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. I know my own mind <laughs> well enough to know the moment I try to go, I'm not going to think about. It, it will take a Jesus be with me. I I I want, uh, and then concentrate, if you will, to take in. You know, what do I see with the birds flying by or the sounds mm. that are 
reverberating. So I think that uh, feels like, even as we talk, um, I'm grateful for this because a, a part of me goes, oh, I think I'm j just maybe an inch closer to being able to go, oh, I think you don't want to hold grief. Y you can't give up grief. Mm -hmm. um, hold that ambivalence. And that's something you need to be able to give as this is a burden um, that you're not meant to carry. So if my burden is easy, I can use that as an assessment tool. Maybe I won't come to any point of clarity other than mm -hmm. at least I know I am, I am carrying something here that doesn't seem to fit with Matthew 11. But yeah. in that, to be able to carry what I am meant to carry, even if it looks pretty heavy to the outside world, is actually easy compared to bearing what I'm not. Hmm. Well, I will wish for you um, a kind of being still and present that you do see the tiny, tiny bugs and the multiple mm -hmm. layers up in the atmosphere. <laughs> well, uh, it, let's just say if in the next 72 hours, I choose to repent. I will document, have my wife document it and send you a photo. <laughs> I will look forward to anticipating that. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.